Yes, hello folks, welcome to the weekly Manchester United podcast. I'm your host as always, Phil Brown. I'm with my regular co-host, the excellent James Rhodes, on this Monday. Um, after the Aston Villa result, of course, we also had the Porter result in between from the last time we recorded this podcast. We'll talk about that and some other talking points around the club. Um, I'm going to ask, before, before I ask how you're doing, I've, I've thought about this podcast for a long time. I'm like I don't want to just do an hour of ranting and negativity because yep. I, I I feel that there's a lot of people that just are exhausted with it, and I am too. Yeah, same. Uh, it's I mean it's, it's hard to get through sometimes, but anyway, how you doing, mate? Yeah, doing all right. Otherwise, I mean, uh, it's, um, yeah, doing okay. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, um, the ironic thing is, of course, a draw away to Porto and a draw away to Aston Villa in isolation is actually not bad results, but in mm-hmm. relation to everything else, yeah, um, neither performance or result done anything to address a lot of the concerns, of course, around Eric Ten Hag's future and uh. What happens next? Of course, Ineos will be meeting tomorrow, I believe. It's Tuesday, isn't it? I think they met yeah. today. And they meet, yeah, meet a lot of tomorrow. a few different things, obviously, because there's you mm. know it's, their whole life doesn't resolve or revolve around the, the manager and the manager decision. Of course, when there were no projects, yeah. <laughs> well, apparently, it does for most of us. It yeah. seems mm-hmm. like <laughs> it feels like it sometimes, right? You know that that sets the mood, the tone. That's all you can think about. That it's when you want to wake up and think about the manager every day. I mean, I didn't expect expect to be having dreams about Eric Ten Hag, you know, but uh, but here we are. My wife's sitting there asking me, you know, what am I talking about in my sleep? She thinks I'm, you know, dreaming about other women's, but it's it's just the bald Dutchman. Um, but uh, okay, and, uh, yeah, quickly segue <laughs> off this. Uh, your ears is veering into territory that you may not be able to recover from. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, yes, they have to meet on the stadium is a huge topic that involves <laughs> A lot of things, you know, Gary Neville was there at Old Trafford. He's heavily involved, obviously, in the stadium regeneration project, all of that. Mm. There's a lot of things. And these international break meetings, for the most part, um, to make it clear, it, it they're not – I don't think we have the type of owners at the moment who are going to be, like, scheduling emergency meetings, okay, because I just don't think that's how they operate, right? They're going to – have these regular meetings every single international break where they're going to take stock of everything that's going on, review it, discuss it, and decide on plans moving forward. And this one is really no different to that. It's just that obviously it's going to be more of a talking point. They were very unlikely to to have a a, a deep discussion about Eric Ten Hag after two games, you know, or three games as it was the first international break. So, you know, this one will be uh, is a bit more <laughs> with everything that's gone on since the last one to to discuss that but um yeah yeah they're gonna they're gonna discuss that uh, among all the other projects at uh, at united that are being worked on i mean when jim ratcliffe was asked about ten hog uh I don't know, thursday or friday of last week i think he answered the question the right way because mm-hmm. i don't think he should be given an opinion you know he was neutral you know which if he's not involved in the decision-making process and genuinely leaves it down to the people he pays to do that, then I don't think he should be given, oh, I do support him, I don't support him. I think it's better just to be neutral and say, look, I don't I don't get involved with the football side of things because whatever he says, it's going to influence any evaluation process. And uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's given his thoughts in private. It would be hard for me to believe that he is happy with what he's seen the first, mm-hmm. you know, two months or so of the season. Uh, I, I don't believe for one minute that they thought they'd be in this position. Um, I think they knew it wasn't going to be perfect, that, um, you know, United weren't ready to be a team that um, you know, done what Liverpool have done, you know, or anything like that. They just don't have that consistency in their game. But... Um, you know, before we did this podcast, they had accumulated all these stats, and I just threw them out. It was like <laughs> they're so they're so bad yeah. <laughs> that it's genuinely hard to believe. It's and really no different to last year, right? I mean, when you break all the stats, it's down, worse games. Yeah, I think it's, and we have because a lot when more I get players. The last minute winners, you know, when yeah. I get the, when I get yeah. in the Brantfords, the Wolves, and all that. There, yeah. 
Um, I'm watching. I'm 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 sitting there and I'm wondering. You know, I don't need the start. You don't need the stats. Just the game speaks for itself. Yeah. And I'm not a, a football guru. I'm not. A, I don't know how to fix this beyond yeah. some yeah. of the obvious. You know, change the manager all that. There. Um. I was watching the, when I was watching the Villa game at the weekend. I'm like, I can't remember. Maybe you should hump in it for a bit where I actually watched the United game and enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I'll find out, but I would say maybe before that. But I'm like, this is supposed to be entertainment. This is supposed to be, in, you know, in, uh, uh, this is supposed to be a, a, a positive distraction from all the shit that's going on in your life. And you're watching this, and I was thinking, if I wasn't a Manchester United fan, I was watching this, I would say, how do you watch that every week? I mean, there's, it it, it was, mm. and, and it's very bad. And yeah. when I hear things like, oh, we're, as you can see, we're improving, I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. And what I want to know is, what does an Eric Ten Hag uh, football team look like when it's functioning at its you know, right. optimal levels. Is it this? Yeah. You know, it, because, you know, what, what what does it actually look like? I don't know. And now everyone's entitled to feel how they feel and have their own opinions. But honestly, mate, uh, sometimes I ask myself, why am I doing this? Like, this is just so painful to watch that. And of course, you support your club through thick and thin. I don't make, you don't make that choice. But, what is actually happening here? Like, I, I, you, United, if they score goals in a game, they'll concede a ton. Or if they defend and don't concede, they won't score. But this is a football team that either draws or loses, rarely scores, and occasionally you get the odd win in between. <laughs> How is this allowed to continue? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's the question. And, you know, I, I one can... As we have, I mean, I take take um, talk about other managers, other clubs, uh, things you know, clubs like Tottenham and all of that, where they're not always getting the results. But it's really, it's interesting because the answers to those questions you can't see it. If you watch Tottenham, you can answer the question whether they're flawed, good, bad, you know, conceding late goals, you know, defensively suspect aside you can look at their team and know what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I recall back, uh, you know, kind of learned this as a, as a fan of it, because I recall back during Klopp's early tenure, everybody taking the piss out of Liverpool for their conceding late goals, bottling games, things like that, because they did a lot, but you could see it. If you stepped back a little bit, there was a very, very direct, very clear way of playing. You could tell this is how Jurgen Klopp plays football. This is how Liverpool play football under Jurgen Klopp. Whether it gets got all the way gets all the way to the top, you you can't answer that question. Just like you can't for Spurs, they could end up falling apart, and it never gets there, and it's never good enough, and it probably won't be. But you could see that for Klopp back then, and it did get to the top level, and they won a Champions League, and they won a Premier League, um, and they won major things. But you could see it. Uh, you could see it with even with Mikel Arteta, and that's where the comments. In comparisons, made sense for a year, maybe two. But by the third season of Arsenal, the third season of Mikel Arteta, they were challenging for the league. Uh, and you could see it even in the years prior. You know this is how a Mikel Arteta team plays. This is how Arsenal plays under him. Whether it's good enough, whether it's entertaining enough, those are different questions, but you knew it. It is the, the biggest indictment, I think, and the biggest problem as a fan is that I think every single one of us would sit here and say, look, if we knew we were going to play this way and we can see that we're getting really good at something, really good at something, not at everything, because that is part of a process. You get good at one thing and then you keep adding on more things and building and building until you're good at all of them. It's the same way you learn how to do anything. You get good at one thing really, really well. Uh, And then you can take on more. And we were saying, okay, we're really good at this and we're dynamic and we're attacking and we're scoring goals, but we're conceding a lot of chances. we got to figure that out. It would be one thing. United aren't really particularly good at anything. I don't think there's a single thing you could sit there and say, we do this well and consistently. 
And, and that's, I don't think that takes years to know and to see that. I don't think it takes years to say, to see a team be able to get good at something at least. Um, because there's a lot of pieces towards putting together an overall top performance. Um, I don't know any of it. I think we're on, on average bad at everything, <laughs> you know, uh, and I uh, don't know. It's, and that, that really is the, is the problem. You, you, you know, like you said, it's not even so much. You don't know what we're going to get with United anymore. We do know what we're going to get and it's going to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be bad well, every single week. There's about three or four different versions of a United game that you get. And that's yeah. pretty much it. Right. Yeah. So you get the pragmatism of, you know, what you got when, you know, at the weekend or, you know, calamitous mistakes, you know, or, you know, a, 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 a when make you get at Southampton, you know, um, you know, or j- and consistent draws. And so you toggle between two or three, four different emotions yeah. that all are incredibly familiar and you're watching the game and you're like, I've seen this game a million times before. And I think these are part of the things that, can, that you have to be concerned about is the same problems keep showing up that it was, that it was showing up last season and it's and conti- continuing to show up. And when I hear, you know, every week we have to improve, we have to improve. Like, That's your job. To make them yes. improve. <laughs> I know that they have to improve, but this is, you're responsible for that improvement. And um, this is also the issue when you have a manager. Like I, I agree that any of us will look beyond the result and, and the body of work will be evaluated comprehensively. But when a manager is managing to keep his job because he feels like he's a defeat away from getting sacked, mm. then you can't build anything with that mm-hmm. because everything is about the immediate. And I... And I asked myself, is that what Ten Hag did at the weekend? And then I look at the team he picked, and I'm like, he is legitimately coaching, managing United. Like, he's certain he's going to be here for the rest of the season. Because I, I, I don't understand this new idea of rotation, which he never did. Like, he never did this in his first season. You know, I remember what United playing Reading and stuff in the Cup where Christian Eriksen got injured. And I think that was the first time he had rested Casemiro. He ended up bringing him on that game. I'm like, he never rotates, and now mm-hmm. all of a sudden he's rotating. I'm like, I, I do, I don't like, I don't understand it. And then every time he brings players on the pitch, subs, yep, they, they never changes the game. Yeah, never changes the game for United in the batter and, and for, for the batter. Yep. Uh, Xerxes was per game yesterday. Mm-hmm. Or Nacho per game. You know, uh, um, Xerxes taking a lot of heat online after the game. I didn't spend a lot of time on, online, but, you know, to me, technically a good player, but you need goals in the middle. And, man, I, I'm trying not to delve into the negative. I'm trying to, we all know what we're watching. Yeah. We all, we, it, to me, what we're seeing now is beyond, you know, this analysis. You should have done this. This will happen. You should have done. It's beyond that, where it's like, okay, yep. there is no corrective process here. Mm-hmm. That you could say, do this and this. You know, be, this is to me a decision that any of us don't want to make, but have to make because the football club is in the worst on the field. This is the worst team that I remember mm-hmm. in my lifetime. And I remember the 80s and, you know, I was looking at it through a different lens as a child, but I'm looking at this United team going, I mean, this is diabolical, man. This is, this is very, very difficult to watch. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and we've seen a lot of difficult times and things like that. But, you know, we, when we saw in the late stages of, of Jose Mourinho or Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, it was only like two games, you know, two really bad games. And then they both got sacked and, and that was it. You know, we had even, I mean, even in, in Jose's final season, uh, some people remember it a certain way, but we had like comeback wins against Juventus and Manchester City, you know, Manchester City was a bit earlier, but we had things like that, that were, that were happening. And, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. It, it is bad and it's hard because it's not like we can all sit here and say, well, let's just, if we just start this player, right? That's what you're saying. It's sort of beyond the analysis because I don't think anybody can sit there and say, there's any 11 we can put together that I think will work at this point um, because it just feels broken. And 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 what I, what I what I don't like where things go sometimes that gets rather frustrating is we go through this cycle of 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 things where and I'm not trying to pin it all on the manager either in this in this but we go through the cycle each time where then it gets it goes on long enough and then it gets decided that all the players are bad so now we don't have any good players any le- anymore and then we end up with the next manager and so, and a lot of the players who were bad for the prior manager who were no longer good enough are suddenly performing or are suddenly good enough for the next match. You know, we take situations like Harry Maguire and Scott McTominay last season, players who were, who were not good enough. Um, but then they're largely the reason that Ten Hag is still in the job today, are performances of players like that. And um, and it goes through an endless cycle of, of trying to analyze it and then it getting so bad that you break down and all the players are bad. And then it gets you just spiral into this depression where no players are good enough and no staff are good enough and nothing's good enough so we're never going to get anywhere and um and i think that's something that they have to be wary of too you know the management and all of this because it's i, I just uh, the reason i just bring this up is that it, it it got to a point where you've seen in the last few years it spills over i mean the abuse that for example harry maguire got for some time was directly as a result of of things spiraling to a point where it was it was decided like Harry Maguire's the problem with this team and we're never going to win you know beyond the regular criticisms of Harry Maguire or doubts over his ability it spirals you've seen it with Marcus Rashford where it spirals into it it's going there with Bruno Fernandez and it will be there soon you know where you can have doubts over how he's playing but it's spiraling to a point it, you know David De Gea was the same thing we saw that with David De Gea and and I've had you know and even if technically or analytically or whatever you can look at and say yeah we should have got a new keeper it's it keeps happening and there's going to be and and it makes it a really bad environment that will continue for players too when they sit there getting dogs abuse i mean casemiro we know how unhappy he was with it somehow being turned to casemiro is the problem with the whole team he's actually the worst player ever not the best player ever and um, has ruined the team by coming in and all of that and and it's going to be a new person Every uh, every month that things continue to decline until we have nobody left and everybody's getting abused. Lissandro Martinez, you know, like it's it goes it, it's crazy. You know, these these one year cycles where a player is the best and then they're the worst in the views and 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 it becomes a, almost an untenable environment for them. And, and that's been happening for years, for years. It happened to Pogba, it happened to others where they were the solution and then the problem, and it makes the environment so difficult. One of the things that um, looks a bit strange to me on the outside is Ten Hag seems to me to have um, some of the weirdest sensitivities. And a player Mm -hmm. can play every week and be really poor, not suffer consequences. And when I go back, when I see what happened to Portal, where I can only assume that Riceford was taken off because of what he didn't do defensively. But Marcus Riceford is getting destroyed for not scoring goals. Yeah. And he's the only <laughs> forward that goes through this, right? Yes. And if you want him to be a left wing back, you can't have him up the field scoring goals, right? <laughs> you can't have both. He, his yeah. job is to score goals for Manchester United and create goals. He tore Porto the shreds in that first game, that first half, yeah. and gets hauled off. Now, if you're going to rest a player for 45 minutes, you tell them before the game, say, you know what, you're going to do the first 45, and then we're going to cheat. And if you're... He wasn't, justifying... right? And he wasn't. No, of course not. And if you're <laughs> justifying that saying, well, the other guy that's got that has to play, he's was outstanding in our last game. Well, then why is he on the bench? <laughs> if he was so sensational that he has to play, why is he on the bench, mate? Mm. Why, you know, Garnacho and Rashford can play in the same team. Yeah. But then I'm looking at the second half and 
when Porto are attacking and Aiden Garnacho's not even in a shot. Mm-mm. Like he's not even in the frame. Nope. And I'm like, I don't get it. So the, the, I mean, I have to assume that he took Rashford off for this reason, but this guy doesn't have to defend. Igarte hasn't played since Spurs. Now, I have to assume that Ten Hag has partially held him accountable for what happened at Spurs against Spurs. I don't know whether he's been singled out saying, you're the problem, you did this. And I'm going, to, I, I don't get any of this. Like, he can be very harsh with some people mm-hmm. and hold them to insane standards. And then others, he doesn't. And I, I, I just can't see any coherence, consistency, continuity with the... I, I don't understand. Like, I mean, it must be brutal if you're a player. Yeah. Or I, I, What do you want me to be? If you want me to be a left wing back, okay, and defend that deep, then you need to go on TV and say, I'm asking my players to play deeper. Because yep. these forwards are getting slaughtered for not scoring goals. But to me, if you look at that Porto goal, it was the same goal that happened against Brighton. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. No pressure on the ball. Where's my fullback? Where's my central defenders who were terrible? Yeah. Right? The yeah. leg gets beaten to the ball twice, right? Yep. By a forward. Um, and that's the same goal that the leg conceded for Holland on the last international break where Kuman hauled them off. Yeah. Right? And what, but yet Marcus Rashford, who's a forward, is being punished for not closing a cross down. Mate, mm-hmm. your central defenders, both of whom you bought. Okay, are on the pitch. Yeah. Your fullback, where's he? Yeah, well, Sandra didn't he, follow up the rebound on the first goal either at all. I know. He was, he was and, lost. And, yeah. And, like, I, I don't understand. Like, th- this is, you know, he gets dropped for Palace and you don't score <laughs> after having the best week of his career in a year. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, is he trying to get sacked? Well, it is. I, it is. I, I, it's I'm bizarre. Like, it is. Put that team out. I'm like, why? Yeah. You're resting yeah. players. Some of them won't be, won't be going with their international teams. It just is baffling to me. Yeah. And uh, anyway, um, the big question, of course, is what happens next. Yeah. So, what do you think happens next? Well, yeah, and I've I've had a couple of conversations, um, and I think what's important to note, and just very clearly is that, I mean, nobody knows <laughs> yet, right? Exactly what happens next. Because when you have Sir Jim Brailsford, Joe Glazer, Dan Ashworth, Omar Barada, and Wilcox all going to be getting together to discuss this, that's six people who are going to be t- talking about the situation. And they're all partially responsible for it in one way or another, right? For what's happening right now, they all will have different perspectives, different opinions, different things like that. Um, And the purpose of these discussions is to decide upon the plans, right, and lay them out. Now, as far as I understand it, they probably want to give him, would ideally want to give him more time. Because this is right now essentially the worst case scenario what has played out, right, when they kept him in the summer. This is the worst case scenario. This was the thing that they did not expect. Now, one could say that was quite foolish. I would a little bit say it was quite foolish because I think that in a large respect, this was a bit of a doomed project from the start, even without taking the blame on Ten Hag, because he's just not their guy. That was why they looked for somebody else in the first place. He's not their guy. And that he knows he's not their guy and he knows what happened over summer and they can try to go around and around that all they want and it's still going to be there you know it's still going to be underlying all of it that he's not their guy that they didn't hire him that they looked for replacements for him that they basically offered the job to multiple other people and got turned down and then crawled back to him you know as it was said with with like you know i don't remember what the word for it was but uh you know, <laughs> that they had to smooth things over on the whole thing, that they left him in the dark for three weeks. I put all of that blame on them for that whole situation, how it played out, because to me, it's doomed from the start due to things like that. It's just a, an underlying problem. Um, but there's a few considerations that are at play here, which is number one, can you replace him now? Um, and who can you replace him with? 
And is it going to be somebody who uh, is actually someone you want for the long term, or you're just getting them because they're available? Uh, example being, you know, take Thomas Tuchel, right? Um, Thomas Tuchel, someone that they like, but I don't think is nearly as unanimously liked as it might appear. He's had trouble falling out with a board every club that he's been at, right? He's been a short-term manager at every club that he's been at recently and, and has had trouble in each instance. Is that what they want or is that like we should do that because he is somebody who could salvage the season? I mean, he came in and won a, a, Ch a Champions League, right, with Chelsea coming in midseason. So we know he's someone who can salvage things in the short term and is a good manager, but is he who you want in the long term? Are any of the managers you might want in the long term, if you're choosing to let go of Ten Hag, um, available now? A lot of managers do quite highly value loyalty. I don't think a lot of managers want to leave their job midseason for another one. It can be very damaging to their careers to do so. There's, there's no guarantees how that's going to play out. You know, Javi Alonso is not going to leave Leverkusen midseason for any amount of money. It's just not going to happen. That's not, or, or someone like Madrid would have already done it. You know, I'm not saying Madrid specifically because I'm sure they're happy with Ancelotti, but a lot of managers aren't going to leave midseason. Even managers in the Premier League, you know, Kieran McKenna, if you like him for the future, well, he, you had a chance at him in summer and you didn't give him the job and he signed a new contract with Ipswich and he's going to be there trying to keep them up this season. You know, so that is a consideration that has to be played into it. And so, you know, those are the discussions that they will have. And then, okay, well, if we're going to stick with, if we can't do that, can we give it to Ruud van Nistelrooy as a, as an interim manager for the rest of the season? Is that going to be any better than what we have? Can we do it for the next two months while we search out somebody else? Um, we don't know, right? We don't know if that's going to be any better and we don't know where they'll reach on that conclusion or do they conclude, fine, we need to do something about this, but um, we keep Ten Hag while we're assessing all of these things over the next four to six weeks once again to figuring it out. I'm not saying that I love any of the permutations of all of this because again, I think this was the risk that they took when they when they had him stay in the summer is that if it went bad, it's it the season's kind of you're in trouble, you know like you there's no ideal scenario to replacing your manager midseason. There's none and that was the risk that they took. Look, I'm relatively certain any of will have been thinking about this question from the summer anyway. Sure. Right? Because if they weren't working off the high probability that this is not going to work out and to be evaluating candidates prior to, you know, you know, from the summer onwards, prior to any of this, really, this season, then I, I would be totally amazed. I mean, I, uh, they, they obviously have ideas on... You know who would be even if Ten Hag did work. What's the contingency? That's what yeah. a football, you know, a proper forward-thinking football club does. Yeah. Is that you have, you know, obvious alternatives if something happens with your manager. Um, I think where it gets a bit complicated, James, um, is you bring in someone like Thomas Tuchel. There, they have to get rid of Van Nistelrooy too. Yeah, they have to get rid of all those people in the back room. You know, yep. staff and Van Nistelrooy is a popular appointment that you needed. Mm -hmm. um, can you get rid of him after three months? It, it, this is, you know, there's big questions to be answered here. And, and there's still some people that, you know, Fergie got time and all this. Yeah, but what if you needed how to give Ron Atkinson that time? Fergie never yeah, would have happened. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, that's and, true. And, and so, it's a good alternative uh, yeah, argument. So, to you know, yeah, if Ron Atkinson had got that time, you know, maybe none of those Premier Leagues happen, those European Cups. So, yeah, I understand that giving someone time gives someone time. But, you know, the, the Ferguson happened because you need to choose not to give someone time after winning an FA Cup. Um, mm. And... Uh, so uh, I'm looking at this and going, it it would be expensive, and obviously you know PSR is a factor in this to replace Ten Hag. I think obviously any of us would made a decision over the summer to stick with him, so they can't completely divorce themselves from this failure either. Yep. But a fair question has to be asked: With Rude, does he get to divorce himself from this failure? Is because maybe some of what's going on at United, he has to take responsibility for too. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you know United yeah. fans won't like that, but the, the, if you ask the players, you know what, what would their 
response be? I think. Um, yeah, and, and we don't know, you know, for Dan Ashworth and Wilcox and such assessing things, if they're sitting there looking and saying, we haven't really seen anything from Rude to suggest he'd be any better. You know, we don't know yeah. that, you know, it's well, an unknown factor. If you look at what happened with Funnestore at PSV, you know, mm -hmm. you had players that were complaining to the board about him. This happens in football. And he felt that he needed at least another year or two as a number two. Mm -hmm. Certainly wasn't playing sailing at PSV. And um, so, but that's that's true of anyone, you know, is yeah. any, any manager is going to have these issues. Um, and uh, I, I'm looking at this and then I'm thinking a bit about the Benny McCarthy interview where he's talking about Ken Hag lacking that passion. And, right. you know, you can't change your personality. I don't know how big a thing this is for footballers. They, they'd have to tell you that. But maybe see this little argument with Van Nistelrooy and Ten Hag at the yeah. weekend. I actually yeah. think that some of that stuff is healthy. Yeah. You know, because is, usually. I, I don't know if they're arguing over something going on in the field, but if they're arguing over different ideas, that, that's healthy. That's what I, there's, I don't think that needs any controversy or that should be happening on a team that's not winning. I want to yep. see people emotionally engaged with each other, you know, arguing with, with intensity over what we need to do to get right. Because it's not important who's right, it's important what's right. And that's it. And right. so, um, and Van Nistelrooy is in that team partly to get United scoring goals, which they're not doing. Uh, and, and so I'm sure he does feel pressure too. Yeah. But it, but it would seem to me that if the obvious choice would be rude on at yeah. the very least until the end of the season, um, I, I would be surprised if they brought Tuchel in right now. Same. Anyway, yeah. The other part of this, James, is Tuchel didn't want the contract that United were offering. And Ten Hag didn't send it either. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really interesting to see what exactly are any of us wanting from their manager. Mm -hmm. Because this has to be a consideration for them too. Do we go back to Thomas Tuchel and say, actually, you know what? We got it wrong two months ago. We're going to give you what we what we wouldn't give you two months ago. I mean, that... These, these, do they, they compromise on what they want in the long term just to, to, but this to do is the that? Thing. Yeah. You, when you come into a football club, you have a very clear concept. This is these are not learning; they're not learning on a job, right? So yeah. you know, they'll have decided long before they come in. This is the framework that we want to work with. Yep. So now you want to start compromising it three months in. You know, this is where I you have so. to. You, you you there's a lot to consider for any of us, yep. and I think United because there's so much chaos until uh, until you get a. A settled, happy environment. United need more than a coach as a manager. Yeah. I right. think they need a, co a, a manager and a coach. Mm -hmm. Some guys are really, really good at coaching, but there's a very strong infrastructure behind them that supports them on leadership, on incentives, on consequences, all that, uh, and you can get away with that. But at United, that's still, you know, that structure's really still you know, not operating on the optimal levels that it needs to be to provide that support. So someone like Kieran McKenna, I think we're getting eaten up at United because I think that it, they need someone that has experience that, that is also a manager. Yeah. And, uh, I think, um, you know, Kieran, that's a whole different level of pressure. And I, I think uh, it's better for him just his first season in the Premier League as a manager, just stay where you are. And, I think for United, they need a, a, a manager with a track record because inevitably when the bad times happen, that track record gets you through. But I don't think they should have a Graham Potter or anything like that. Has right, to be yeah. That has a track record of success. Yeah, and, and I, I've come back and forth on that aspect of it, you know, the modern coach versus and this and that. But I think I've settled in, in a lot of agreement on what you're saying there. The more that I've looked at it and observed, and I think that I've – you know, uh, definitely changed my view on this on a number of occasions. But I, but when I look at the most successful managers, I think personality comes to the forefront on a lot of them, right? All of them have a very strong personality. You know, we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and, you know, and that's what you're saying on manager. When we were talking about, when we had more of a discussion about, you know, at the end of the day, the job is a lot about managing people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's really the majority of the job is managing people mm -hmm. and being, and this, and finding this balance, especially in, a, in an environment that's not great. 
when you talk about things like holding people accountable, being fair, being even, these are not coaching things. These are people things. You know, these are how you manage people, right? When you're talking about how you hold people accountable, how you discipline, how you praise, how you reward, you know, these are the things that Sir Alex would talk about in his interviews, not the coaching, not the tactics, not the, you know, the, well, I press this way and I press that way and I change this and that. He talked a lot about the management of people, understandably. And when you go back to the greatest coaches in different sports, it's pretty much one for one the same. I mean, Phil Jackson and, and the NBA and these types of things, they're people managers, you know? And um, and so I do think that the 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 personality aspect is there. You know, Pep Guardiola I'm, is, is certainly a very brilliant coach, but he has a hell of a personality as well on top of that. And a lot of, a lot of confidence and a lot of strength. And he's a, quite a leader in that respect too. And you can, you can see it. I mean, it's, um, I mean, you don't usually get coaches going up to the opposition's winger after a game, like he did with Adama Traore at the weekend and instructing them and talking to them. I mean, this is quite a, quite an interesting person. Pep Guardiola is all, all of the things aside. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't agree. Enemies, though. Well, yeah, look, I'm not saying he's a Mark perfect okay. person. He, you know what he, I mean? He's swap he's, 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 a bit. Yeah, you for know, sure. Okay, Absolutely. You know, they're, they're <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, you know, Look, I'm, there, I'm, there's you know. an act that goes with that. But what famous person isn't? You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe Lionel Messi to a degree, but I don't know. You know, besides that, when you when you look at the sport, there's certainly a lot of being in love with your own image that goes through uh, through certain high performance individuals as well. <laughs> uh, more, some more than others. As well? What's that? Do you dream about Pep as well? <laughs> no, I definitely don't dream about Pep. Well, did you, you have know? did you have a clean sheet in the morning? <laughs> most importantly? Four clean sheets. Four clean sheets. That's progress. Um, no, but um <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh no, but I do agree. And I think that it's hard to get someone like that. And I think that, you know, I think it's hard to write find the right person there, right? You know, and I think that then it's hard to find someone like that who balances in it. And when you can find someone who has both you know, then you're really, then you're really flying, right. Um, in terms of the best managers, but, um, that is a challenge. And I think that that is also understood, you know, I don't think Graham Potter is being considered anymore for that reason, you know, someone that they have liked in the past and that worked at Brighton, but the job was to swallow him a bit at Chelsea. And maybe if United were very well set up, very well established, you know, then you'd look at someone like him and, and think it'd be more successful, but I don't think he'd have a hope in hell. Of uh, of motivating and of getting people going in the way that is needed at the moment, um, so I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think that someone like you know Gareth Southgate, that's actually one of the pluses in his favor, despite how fans see him. Um, but I think that the negativity that surrounds him is uh, is is too much for them as well. Um, and so you know, I, I yeah, it's a it's a tricky thing, and it's tricky in terms of who's available now and all of that. James, as well, any of us will get this right. United yeah. will not be like this forever. Yeah, okay? and inevitably in that process there will be mistakes, there will be errors. That's a hundred percent, and everyone should yeah. expect that they will not be perfect. But if there is one slight positive in all of this, it's that United aren't going on a run that's papering over the cracks. Mm -hmm. So yes. any of us are being confronted right now with every failure point inside the football club, every weakness, every hole in the boat, it's right in front of their face. But then go like on a three or four month run where you're playing great football, everything's fine, and, and you, you're not aware of the problems inside the club because they haven't raised their heads yet. Now you're looking at everything and saying, this is, you know, if there's a positive, it's that every problem that is affected United that has them on the same arc, you know, this same curve, this entropy of, you know, doing well and then the third season being a complete shit show. Yep. It's right there naked in front of them. So this is exactly yep. you know what needs to be fixed. Yep. So to me, they will fix this. I and mean, it's the first time we've had people in, say, this football club, one, that have their own money invested in the outcome, two, that have a level of expertise. And, you know, no one can predict the future. So, obviously, you know, over the summer, I was agnostic, you know, probably thought Ten Hag deserved 
to stay. But I, I, as we have talked about many times, I can completely understand the argument for sacking him. Yeah. So, you know, if any of us had have sacked Ten Hag and brought in another guy and it was it looked something like this, he'd be yeah. getting slaughtered. They, uh, oh, you sacked the guy one, two trophies, you know, he had all these injuries. All of that would be happening. Yep. So there's no, there was no, and bear in mind, they were just in the football club. So there was, it's yes, you would have to say right now the decision to keep up with summer was wrong. I mean, I mean, they'd have to admit that. But it's a probability thing. It's not a certainty on the outcome. So, okay, well, based on the information that we have, this is what we're going to do. And, um, but at this point, it's hard for me to think that there would be anyone on that board as well to stake the reputation on continuing with this. Um, and to me, it's they will get it right. It'll be bumpy for a while. But if they if 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 they weren't there, I can't imagine this could get a lot worse. Yeah, they're intelligent people. They are investing money. They've done amazing work with the academy. They have obviously invested in the infrastructure of the football club, the training facilities. You know, they've upgraded medical staff, all these things that were not there pre uh, prior. Uh, they communicate with fans, and you know, they will get this right, 100%. And with Ten Hag, I mean, it, it, he, I, mean I, I, they're, they're, I don't think he, he lost the season, James. Right? No, and, 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 and even if he did, you have to decide to give him how are we going to agree a new contract going forward? Because that would have to be done at some point this season. I think we're kind of past that already in a lot that, of ways. That's what I'm saying. Know? It's not just sticking yeah. with him at the end of the season, it's sticking with him for because to stick with him to the end of the season, you know, you're making that commitment to stick with him for the next three seasons. Yeah. Because if you're going to keep him this season, you'd have to give him a new contract at some point. Because it's from I mean, we didn't sign the last one, so you, at some point, there'd have to be agreement on new terms, and I and I don't think United would would have any appetite for that. I mean, it, at this point, it, it would be a miracle if United recovered, and I would love to see it. I'd love to be sitting here two months from now going, Ten Hag's pulled off a miracle. He's got them playing unbelievable football. You know, United are exciting. They're winning games. They lose the odd one here or there. I'd be delighted. Because I don't really want to go through the process of a new manager, a whole everything again, but I'm not my wits end. They're watching it. It's very, very painful. And I, I don't want to, I just have no appetite to watch these games because it's just watching United lose or, you know, do silly things or players, you know, losing their, you know, you know their discipline. It, you, you, when you see what Bruno Fernandes and stuff did, and look, Rashford was lucky not to be sent off yesterday. Mm. You can see the petulance from the players that they're exhausted with it. I guarantee you a significant number of them are delighted to go away with the national teams. Yep. Yep. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I agree with all of those points. And so, you know, it's it's a it's a difficult situation. I do think that, you know, in again, in essence, not having it clear in summer and resulting in this means there's really no ideal. And I understand it. I'm kind of faced with that, that like looking at the situation and thinking, I don't see some magical solution that makes this season all better with everything that's happened. I just don't. I think it's going to be a difficult season no matter what happens. But I do think in the long term, regardless, we'll end up in the right way. I think that, you know, there's there's criticism deserved, things like that, fine. I think that, you know, if we'd been under different ownership, you know, Glazers in the past or something, would, would Ten Hag be sacked? Probably, yeah. But mm -hmm. what would we do next? make the complete wrong decision as well. We would hire the wrong person. We would hire, you know, Allegri or something like that, that people would be absolutely miserable with 12 months from now and, mm -hmm. and begging and begging to start over again, just because we could, you know, and he was available and he was a big name or something like that. You know, that's Did what would happen. By court order, James. Yeah. <laughs> Did we get an attack there on going? Cause honestly, they, they, I mean, I, I used to do this podcast years ago with a, with a, a um, Italian friend of mine, and when Allegri was at AC Milan, um, <laughs> he's a big AC Milan fan. The stuff that he would tell me about, um, you know, how negative and you know, boring his football was, and so 
these are the things that anyone will know how to evaluate yes. properly for and all that's going to go, this is yeah. not the right person for us. Yeah. Um, but I understand why these things are being brought up. Everyone just wants this to stop. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, my my opinion, semi-informed opinion personally, is that I think it's a little more likely that he stays on for a little bit longer. Um, I think the leash is going to be incredibly short. And I can't say I 100% agree, but uh, that the leash would be very, very short. Um, the next most likely thing is that he goes and, and Ben Histeroy takes over for the rest of the season. And then I, I think it's far less likely that we get anybody else in the door you know, to be in a permanent manager during the season or anything like that. I think all of, I think that's well below the possibility of Tenog sticking it out for a bit longer at, or Rude taking over. And and so I think we're, we're, we're pretty much very likely going to see one of those two things in, in terms of the outcome here. Yeah. Um, like I said, I want to end this on a positive um, yeah. because uh, I do believe this is, you know, we're going through a tough time right now, but this will get this will significantly improve at some point because we have the right people at the club. Um, the United's current league position to me is representative, it's not a false position. Mm-hmm. This is something that we can't be talking about in the next international break because financially, I don't know if any can afford to just wait off the season, but to me, it's like I trust them if I yeah. don't trust them ten hog and his team i trust that finally we have people in this football club that will make the right decisions i know not everyone thinks that you know i've, I've seen stupid stuff like oh they're just like the glazers which you know so many i do believe um or uh, absolutely nothing like the glazers and the decision making process is being made by people who do know what they're doing you know because yep. barada was obviously major architect of what happened at city and they understood the transition from people like Mark Hughes to, you know, Mancini to, you know, Pellegrini to Vance Lee Guardiola and what you need to do to make a guy like Pep Guardiola successful. And that is the infrastructure behind it, which, of course, Guardiola said himself. But yep. I know Can I ask you one more question them. just, for, just, just for fun? Yeah, just for fun on this. What do you think about Thomas Frank now? <laughs> so same thing with, with Kieran McCann and stuff is – that he doesn't have the track record to give you confidence. So if he walks into United, I I think that it would it, 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 that it would be really easy to lose confidence in him. Well, he's never won anything. So right. United, it's going to be bumpy for a while. And like I said, I don't think they're ready for a coach yet. Maybe in a couple of years where everything else is functioning properly behind him. But Frank, for me. Would he, I mean, if you're asking me, would he do a better job than Ten Hag? Probably. But would he be a guy that would start leading United the league titles and stuff? Which that has to be the question with who you mm-hmm. hire next. It can't be, okay, we're going to hire this guy and then get rid of him in a year. Right. It has to be, is this guy going to bring league titles, European Cups? I mean, Barada said that he wants United to win the league in three years. So the next appointment has to be someone that can deliver that. Yep. And yep. I don't believe Thomas Frank would deliver those for United. Not, I mean, maybe I'm being wrong, but I, I, I just that would be my opinion. I just wanted so your I, opinion, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's why I think that if they replace him, they'll go with someone that, you know, you could conceivably see them bring that level of success yep. to United. And um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't go there. Cool. All right, okay. Mary. Um, I know for United fans, this is tough right now. You know, we're all going through it. Um, I tried to avoid negativity as much as possible. It's impossible to cover United right now without um, talking about what we're seeing in front of our face. Okay. And uh, but I didn't want to go on a big long or rant and say things that everybody already knows. So um, if anything happens before. The you know, news where they or something, and we'll come back and do another podcast. But other than that, I, we may take next week off, yeah. Yeah, we'll so, see if anything, anything worth mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. But, um, all right, Mary, I will talk to you later. To, uh, yes. Thanks to everyone for downloading the podcast for uh, all your likes, follows, retweets, everything. It's always appreciated. And uh, possibly back next week, we'll see. Take it easy, Matt. Okay. See you later. Cheers, Bye.